Hey folks, today is Friday, February 14th, 2020. As usual, my name is Jake Baldino, here to talk about all the video game news that has been going on this week. Now, I'm kind of under the weather, just a heads up, sorry if I sound gross, but let's just jump right into the news and talk about next-gen stuff. First up, PlayStation 5. Seems like now we know roughly the manufacturing cost of the next generation PlayStation. So with parts and everything, apparently it costs about $450 per unit for PlayStation to manufacture them. And that might set people off and think, oh my god, the PlayStation 5 is going to cost $600. Well, probably not, because especially at the launch of consoles, most of the time they manufacture and sell these things. Uh, the margins are pretty, pretty small. Like sometimes they're like completely at a loss. Sometimes they're close to it. Uh, so this isn't anything to to totally out of the ordinary other than the fact that it is higher than usual, uh, especially because Apparently, according to this source, certain components in the next generation PlayStation are scarce, causing prices to rise. If you guys know any PC gamers out there, you know memory prices often fluctuate, and it seems like that's going to be the case here hitting the PlayStation 5. According to the source, it's DRAM and NAND flash memory that they're facing issues getting at a decent cost, and also something with uh, the cooling system costing a little bit more because they want to have a good, thorough cooling system in it. It's worth pointing out that previous generation, the PlayStation 4, cost three. $380 to manufacture and then it was sold for $399 so there's that. This leads of course to a lot of speculation what is the next generation PlayStation gonna cost. I don't know but I think either of these consoles whether it's PS5 or Xbox Series X they're gonna be expensive so buckle up if you're a console player. Now on the other side of the, po the pond wherever like uh, Xbox Series X uh, is very interesting it raised a lot of uh, hubbub a few weeks ago when Matt Booty from Xbox went on record saying that uh, they are not doing next-gen exclusives at launch they are not going to have games that you can only play on Xbox Series X uh, they didn't want to take that approach and now most recently Phil Spencer Big Phil has come out and also uh, defend this concept he had an interview with the guys at Gamer Tag Radio shout out to them they are friends of this show uh, definitely check out the podcast if if you want it's not super long but there are some very interesting quotes from phil over there but the biggest one is him kind of backing up this no next gen exclusives thing he says obviously we built our strategy with series x we started with that in mind we wanted to go build a gaming console that was going to be the absolute best that we could deliver on a television and deliver unique capability to creators that they could use to go create the best games. But you don't want to do that to the exclusion of everybody else, and you also want to do that hand-in-hand -hand with developers because developers want to find the widest audience possible. And yes, there are always trade-offs to that. He, he goes on to basically say that he doesn't want to silo or, or group players into just one thing. Uh, they it, it kind of just really is what Microsoft has been trying to do with this stuff it seems like they're building platform first they want your subscription they want you buying their games uh the console is is kind of secondary to that because you can play on pc now most xbox things uh interestingly enough he did also say that third-party developers it, it's up to them for if they want their game to be xbox series x exclusive so that's something to keep in mind but uh yeah more clarification for something that is a very interesting approach to next gen i like sony and microsoft for certain things so i don't really have much of a horse in this race i might come off kind of apathetic but it's really just because i'm, I'm adopting a wait and see approach you know and then pc players are just screaming <laughs> But in some interesting news that has been making the rounds on social media, and I wanted to point it out here because it is very interesting, Jeff Keighley is bailing on E3, which is very interesting. Jeff Keighley, for those of you that don't know, is the guy who puts on the Game Awards. Uh, he hosts various events at uh, Gamescom, and most importantly, E3. Outside of E3, he would do E3 Coliseum, which was like big panels and interviews and stuff like that. He would host the YouTube stream of E3. He said on Twitter, and I quote, for the first time in 25 years, I will not be participating in E3. Uh, when someone asked him what fueled your decision, he said a ton of factors. I just don't really feel comfortable participating given what I know about the show as of today. I think that says a lot about E3 uh, for a particular reason. He's a, he's a big shot. He gets to go behind the scenes. He gets to see all of the stuff that the ESA has planned for the next E3. You know, the ESA has come out and said that they are working to substantially change E3 for this upcoming year because of how things have been. Uh, new experiences, new entertainment, apparently events that go on while you're waiting on a line to see a game. I don't know. Some of it sounds kind of weird, but it was just kind of broad concepts. Maybe that's what set Jeff off and he didn't like that. Uh, the ESA also has had some leadership changes that a lot of people in the industry have not really been down with. Uh, the ESA also accidentally doxed a bunch of people, uh, game journalists, 
analysts, YouTubers, just all types of industry people. And uh, that still kind of sucks. So it's just like a big combination of weird things for E3. So I assume that Jeff is privy to a lot of that stuff behind the scenes. And the fact that he saw that and said, nah, you know what? I'm good. Actually, I'm totally out. That's pretty interesting. Uh, we've talked about E3 a lot in the past and in terms of how it is changing. It is kind of slowly, slowly fizzling out. You know, less of the big companies are attending E3. A lot of them are doing their own things independent of E3 itself as a event organization under one roof. Uh, there are some things that take place across the street. There are some things that take place a couple of days before or after. And you know, I think a lot of companies are realizing like how Nintendo branched off and started doing Nintendo Direct. Some of these companies are realizing we don't need to pay for expensive over the top booth space and crammed in and fight for attention with all these other companies when we can just do our own thing and reach people directly through the internet, through social media. So it's definitely changing. And I think for Jeff to leave, that's really interesting. And I wonder what we're gonna do for E3 now. Cause you know, I mean, love him or hate him, Jeff Keighley definitely like, he clearly runs shit. He puts on good things. So I'm just really curious to see where this is all gonna go. What's this E3 gonna be like in 2020? I don't know, man, we'll keep you posted. And in case you missed it, Bioware did post a big blog post explaining that they are going completely back to the drawing board with Anthem. Uh, they acknowledge that the game is just not up to the standards of what people want, and they've fallen short of their ambition. And they even kind of alluded to the fact that they, they didn't have enough time, and they kind of rushed the game, interestingly enough. Uh, but they said that they are going back to kind of completely overhaul everything. The systems, uh, the, the, the objectives, like just everything other than like the core flying and shooting, which is... Crazy. They're gonna have to put a lot of work into this. Apparently, Anthem as it stands is still going to be up and running, but eventually they're gonna launch a big overhaul for it. And they got their work cut out for them, that's for sure. I will say, it is cool that they have the time and money to try and fix this, because I've said it before with many other games, but hey, if at the end of the day it turns out to completely flip on its head and become a good game, that's another good game out there on the shelves, and I'm, I'm happy about that. We'll see where this goes, though. I just think it was interesting to point out. It didn't really get a lot of hype, but uh, it's interesting just to see, like, it, you know, if you think about the relationship between EA and Bioware, I guess there's still something there. So, yeah. And now, before we move forward, this episode's brought to you by ExpressVPN. Now, we're all online 24-7. You're watching this video, maybe you're playing games. We're all on it constantly. So it's smart to be safe and secure, but VPNs can also be kind of fun. Like using a VPN is straight up great for any unencrypted Wi-Fi network, like public Wi-Fi, coffee shop Wi-Fi, or maybe even traveling, staying at a hotel. Lately though, I've been using it to watch Netflix in different regions because certain territories get way better movies and there's been some Japanese films that I've been wanting to check out. Plus with ExpressVPN, you get that added layer of security because they use the highest standards of encryption available, masking your IP and giving you some anonymity. ExpressVPN is the market leader for VPNs and it's still incredibly easy to use and it's affordable when it comes in under $7 a month when you count our three months free promo. And best part, it's got a 30 day money back guarantee. So take back your internet privacy today and find out how you can get three months free by clicking the link in the description. It's expressvpn.com slash game ranks. And thanks again to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video. Thanks for that. But if we are talking about games that uh, got completely overhauled, uh, The Division 2 is also getting a, a big update. Uh, some, some tweaks and some fixes and some new changes are going out this week. Uh, uh, being followed up by, in March, Warlords of New York, the big expansion, which is taking the D Division team back to New York, and now it's going to be Lower Manhattan, a whole new uh, recreation of New York, one-to-one, -one, just Lower Manhattan, where you didn't really get to go in the original Division, and uh, I like the Division, so I'm really excited about this. I love their 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 creation of New York. It's, it was incredibly accurate and interesting. Now you're going back. Now it's not the winter. Uh, more growth has happened. Uh, it, New York got hit by another hurricane. Thanks a lot, guys. There's a lot of new things to do. The main thing centers around taking out these rogue division agents. Uh, there's going to be new abilities. Uh, the dark zones are getting overhauled. I'm genuinely excited to jump back in. That's just me. But uh, I'm curious to hear what you guys think. Now, some things linked in the description below that you may have missed this week. Uh, the first is Outriders gameplay. Outriders is the people can fly game. Apparently, some, some press and YouTube and Twitch people got to go get their hands on with the game. Things sound interesting, uh, but the gameplay is here. And uh, very curious to hear what you guys think of that. Also, I didn't really have a spot to talk about this anywhere else on the show, but apparently the new Sonic the Hedgehog movie is, is good. If you guys have seen reviews, Rotten Tomatoes, stuff like that. Apparently it's good. I'm, I'm happy to see that. That's nice. And also we've linked in the description below a really cool Skyrim fan mod that seems like massive, dude. They're, they're, they're touting it as like a DLC-sized update for this mod. It's called Apotheosis. 
It's like a new area, new quest line, new enemies, n completely different vibe and almost completely different art style. But it's amazing what people can make when they are given the tools, when they are given the framework of an already existing game. This looks like some weird kind of crazy, uh, judging by the enemy types and stuff, it almost looks like a Skyrim inspired by Dark Souls in terms of From Software's art style. I don't know, man. That's pretty cool. Check that out. All that stuff, everything we talk about is linked in the description below. But uh, next up, we want to talk about some studio changes. Quantic Dream is now finally going completely independent. As you guys probably know, it's the people behind um, Detroit Become Human, most recently, uh, Heavy Rain, Indigo Prophecy. Woo woo! That game's really good. Um, excuse me. Now, they made big news a couple months back when they were putting their games on PC, but now uh, they put out a blog post saying that they have made enough money to go completely independent, which, what does that mean? Uh, it means that they are probably going to have way more control over what they make. Uh, they don't have to take outsider money. They don't have to be a Sony exclusive type thing anymore. So you're probably going to see Quantic Dream games on multiple platforms. But I'm curious to see if they do actually get more creative freedom, like how restricted were they in the past? Because things could re get really buck wild now. I don't know. But on the other side of things, uh, the Need for Speed franchise is going back to Criterion. Criterion is going to be developing the next Need for Speed game, and EA is kind of like dissolving ghost games and moving them to engineering stuff. Possibly some people are going to lose their jobs, and that is unfortunate. Really unfortunate. Uh, it also bums me out because I, I play every Need for Speed game. I just love racing games, and, and, and seeing them finally kind of get it right with Need for Speed Heat, like they, they finally kind of like got there. I don't know. It's a shame. But the bright side is Criterion is working on a Need for Speed game. That's also very good, so good with the bad. Oh, but in other news, Prince of Persia has returned. Yes. I'm so excited. Oh my god, Prince of Persia, what are they going to do? This new Prince of Persia game, it's called Dagger of Time. Holy shit, are we going back to the Sands of Time? No, it's a, it's a VR escape room. Thanks a lot, Ubisoft. Um, so, what is probably going to be a cool experience is just a Prince of Persia VR escape room thing where you have a VR headset, but you have to be in a physical location. Uh, Ubisoft has done this in the past with Assassin's Creed, little spin-off things, but they have 300 locations out there in the world where you can go and, and, and play these games, and it's like a VR escape room where you're interacting with the physical environment, but you see the game environment in your head, you know? We have talked about Prince of Persia forever. When is this thing going to come back? Could it come back? I think... All we can see now is that, all right, Ubisoft still cares about the brand a little bit. They put money into some area of it, even though it's a weird, weird, weird direction. At the very least, the one takeaway we can see is maybe they just haven't forgotten about Prince of Persia. So, yeah. I'm waiting for Prince of Persia eventually, but I'm also still sitting here saying, where is Beyond Good and Evil 2? And also, please give me another Splinter Cell. I sound like a broken record at this point. I don't know. We gotta go. Before we do go, of course, we gotta do that console giveaway we do every single week. You know how it goes down by now? There's a link in the description below. You click it to sign up. You enter once, then you're entered for good. And then every single week, we go in and randomly choose one person to win a free console of their choice. This week's winner is going to be this person right here. Congratulations. Be sure to keep an eye on your inbox, your spam box, stuff like that. Because we're going to be reaching out to you to find out how we can send you your free console but now of course before we go let's talk about everything everything we talked about this week the state of e3 jeff Keighley's leaving he's not the biggest thing but the fact that sony's not really there microsoft's like not really like kind of there what's going to happen to e3 what do you want to happen to e3 have you ever been uh also let's talk about all the next gen talk playstation 5's manufacturing cost how much do you think this thing is going to actually cost retail and do you agree with Microsoft's choices to uh, make no exclusives for next gen? Let people play whatever they want, kind of wherever they want. Do you think it's a dumb move? Do you think it's a bold move or an experimental move? Let's talk about anything we talked about this week down in the comments. We'll be down there as much as possible. Things get a little crazy though, so if you want to yell at me directly, hit me up on Twitter and Instagram at Jake Baldino. But I always say thank you guys for coming around and watching us every Friday. We really appreciate it. Even though I am deathly ill, I actually, they're working from home. So I so they don't get sick. Thanks, guys. Um, but clicking the like button does help us out. We really appreciate it. And if you're new, consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell because we put out videos every single day. But as always, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next time. Pizza's on me.